Hi YouTube, this is Joe Calton with Calton Cutlery. You can find me on the web, CaltonCutlery.com. Okay, so we are continuing our uh, series on how to make a new knife pattern from start to finish. Um, we are, uh, uh, what was the last video? The last video must have been on, oh boy, now, uh, okay, so the last video must have been on the quench. Quenching and um, hardening, and then I think I did an addition to that, which was uh, uh, went into um, you know the different types of, of differential heat treat, where you know you have your edge quench, where your edge gets hardened and your spine and your tang stays softer. You have your uh, differential temper, where you harden the whole thing and then you come back with like a torch or um, you know, a hot piece of steel from the forge, you know, act as a heat sink and you temper back your tang and your spine so that you get a hard edge and a soft back. Um, and then the variations on that, which are using your preheat treat grind um, to remove materials so that the edge heats up faster and cools down faster than the rest of the blade and how you can use that to do a differential uh, heat treat, you know, so that the edge stays harder, gets harder than the spine and the tang. And then also your interrupted quench in addition to uh, differential grind um, and how that can affect your, your heat treat and come up with a differential type heat treat, which the, honestly, the, um, uh, the, your differential grinding is fairly simple and straightforward. Your interrupted quench, you see that a lot on forged in fire, right? And now you got to remember, I was on Forge and Fire, okay? And that is, I mean, it's real. You know, I mean, you show up and when that clock starts, you know, I mean, you have that certain amount of time to make a knife. I mean, there are no, you know, sleight of hands when it comes to that. But there's also, uh, I mean, it's reality TV, okay? So, you know, the, a lot of guys, I mean, they didn't, when I was there, they, they didn't say, hey, ham it up for the camera. I chose to a little bit with the marshmallows. I don't know if you guys saw my episode or not, but um, I actually packed uh, two marshmallow roasting sticks and a bag of, uh, you know, large marshmallows. I love marshmallows, right? And the entire time that that forge and fire thing was, has been on, the whole time I'm sitting there, I'm like, you know what? Somebody has got to do roast marshmallows. I mean, you got all them fires, you know, you've got uh, plenty of time. I mean, they give you gobs and gobs of time. And you know, you got an audience and you're trying to ham it up for the audience. I couldn't believe that nobody, I mean, I wanted to see somebody roast marshmallows on that show. I didn't realize that I was going to have to go there and toast marshmallows myself to be able to make that happen. But anyways, um, so a lot of guys try to ham it up a little bit uh, for Forge and Fire. And the, the interrupted quench, hey, you know, that is, um, that is an easy way to ham things up because you take, you know, your hot blade, now most of the time, they're doing uh, differential grinding or differential forging, you know, so that your, your edge geometry and your whole blade geometry is set up for an interrupted quench. Okay, so the whole idea behind an interrupted quench, because I don't believe I explained this very well in the last video, is, you know, you have the parts that you want to get harder than the rest of the blade thinner, so that they take the heat faster in the forge, and so they reach critical temperature faster. And then when you uh, quench, you know, when you put that hot blade into the oil, it also cools, the thinner sections cool off faster than the thicker sections, okay? There's another thing that's going on there when, <clears throat> you know, when they stab that blade in, they pull it out and it's still on fire and they blow it and then, you know, it blows the flame, you know, you can see it travel along the length of the blade and then go out and then there's a whole bunch of smoke and it's all real cinematic, right? Okay, well, an interrupted quench, not only are you choosing what part gets hard by what part is thinner, but if you do it right, you're also allowing some of the heat that didn't get dissipated in the oil in the thicker sections to come back through and temper the harder sections, okay? So it's a very... There's a lot going, I mean, I won't, don't want to say complicated, but I do want to say that there is an awful lot going on 
almost all at once with an inter interrupted quench. That technique is, it's a lot more art than it is just method. Okay, so like with an edge quench, you know, an edge quench on a straight thickness blade, it's all method. Okay, and what I mean by that is that the, repeat, the results are very repeatable. There's hardly anything that, that you know, goes wrong. Um, it's a very methodical and repeatable way to make a blade. The interrupted quench and differential grinding and differential forging, that is a lot more art and feel than it is method and, yeah. Okay, that's, I think that's about the best way I can explain that. I will do an interrupted quench uh, sometimes, you know, especially when I'm doing uh, like double-edged swords. Um, but I don't do very many of those. And honestly, I feel that that's a technique that's better suited to being in your home shop with your home forge, your home oil, you know, your home steels, you know, your home lighting, all that kind of stuff. Um, doing that on a show like that is uh, a little bit uh, uh, gutsy as far as I'm concerned, I think is a good word. Okay, so the next thing I suppose that we ought to go over is tempering. Um, now, I had the, I can't remember if I went over this or not, so we'll go over it fairly quickly. I use a toaster oven for tempering almost everything, okay? Um, toasters are cheap. They're uh, widely available. Um, the ones that I got, I think I bought two of them brand new, and the third one, my original one, uh, well, no, I guess, that was, I still had that one when I was just running one toaster, and I want to say it's like my fourth or my fifth one of those. It's set up for 1095 and 52100, and, um, you know, it's been going for a long time. It's missing the knobs. I do have a, a video on how do you reach your perfect tempering temperature, um, or it might be entitled how to use a toaster for tempering knives, something like that. And basically what you do is you, uh, you know, you heat treat, harden, you know, you make a couple of these knives, you harden them, then you go ahead and you grind or you do a snap temper it. So if it's 1095, do a two hour cycle at say 300 degrees or do two two hour cycles at 300 degrees. That'll take some of the hardness out so that hopefully if you drop it on the floor, it won't shatter. All right. Now you go ahead and you grind the blade to whatever geometry that, that you're after. You go ahead and do your edge flex test over a brass rod. No, now that I'm thinking about this, I think I did go over it in the last video. And you deflect the edge over that brass rod and see if it springs back. If it does, great, you're kind of in the ballpark. Now go ahead and flex it harder and harder until that edge deforms, whether it chips out, whether it uh, rolls over and stays bent, or whether it cracks to the shoulder of the edge and then, you know, springs back with just a little bit of, of uh, steel that was pushed past its elastic limit and that's where it cracked and then it doesn't you know, spring all the way back, which is about perfect. And then what you do is you adjust your tempering temperature in 10 or 25 degree increments up or down until you get the edge to fail the way that you want it to fail. Okay? So, once you have all that worked out, which I do, so all these blades right here are ready for grinding. Now, um, okay, so if we're ready to grind these blades, the first thing that we need to do is we need to make a grinding stick. <coughs> now the grinding stick, um, this is one of those, I've never seen this technique in a book. I've never seen the technique in a book. The only place I've ever seen this technique happen is in, I want to say like older knife makers. Okay, and not here in the States. Okay, the first place I remember seeing it, there's a video on YouTube. Um, I want to say the guy is Herder, like H E R D E R, you know, the, the knife company. He might, I don't know if he owns the thing or if he's the original guy or if he, um, you know, is just the knife grinder or what. The video is not in English and I don't speak whatever language it is. 
the fellow looks like he's 60s, maybe, you know, working towards 70, something like that. And he's got a knife shop that's in, on like the second floor of an old building. <clears throat> because the next video after that, they show him moving all of his equipment out through the window with a crane, putting it down on the on trucks, taking it to a knife factory somewhere, and then showing him setting it back up, and then showing a couple of young guys, like in their 20s or 30s, how to grind knives the way he was. So it kind of seemed like it was a... You know, like it was the last batch of knives he was grinding or, you know, like he was retiring and passing it on, something like that. Fascinating video. If I knew how to do the link and, um, you know, put it in the description and all that kind of stuff, I would. In fact, I might, I might try that. Uh, link Herder. Okay. So hopefully that will remind me to, to try that out. But anyway, what he was doing, now he's met now, uh, those, the Herder kitchen knives, are very thinly ground, all right, which is what we want in kitchen knives. And honestly, in most using knives, until you get into rough use, possibly fighting knives, I don't know, I, I don't fight with a knife. Well, excuse me, the, the few times that I do fight with a knife, it gets ugly. If I, like if this knife right here, if it was, you know, all warped and crooked and it, it just wouldn't straighten up and I'm sitting there and it's fighting me, you know, I'll take that thing and I'll put a fresh 36 grit belt on the two horse variable speed grinder and I will feed that blade point first right into that 36 grit belt and then turn into a pile of dust on the shop floor and then do a little dance on the pile of dust. That's how you fight with a knife, okay? Or if I'm forging it and it just won't come out, I will put it in the, the forge and heat it up as hot as that thing will get and then pull it out and twist it into a pretzel and then flatten it out and then cool it off, toss it on the floor and then do a dance on what's left of it, right? That's the only way that I fight with a knife. But anyway, so regular, normal, everyday using knives, which is what I make mostly of, okay? Your kitchen knives, your, you know, your everyday carry knives that you use for opening packages and making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and, you know, peeling and cutting apples out or to get the seeds out and all that kind of stuff. Most of them need to be fairly thin. Okay, now, once uh, you start realizing, okay, well, knives don't have to be, you know, thick bladed crowbars, you know, normal everyday using knives, <clears throat> for the most part. If you're a rancher up in Riverton, like my, my buddy Ed is, you know, and you're out there, um, you're out in the field all day long, and you can use a knife that's really tough, or you're using a work knife, you know, you're a handyman, you're prying open uh, painted, stuck, stuck, painted shut windows, um, you know, you're uh, chipping through ice to get to a frozen water shutoff valve, you're cutting miles and miles of insulation, you know, you're do cutting wire, I mean, all that kind of stuff, then yeah, sure, you know, build the knife to where it's a, you know, it's a good, thick, tough knife. But for the most part, like kitchen knives and stuff, knives are built way too thick for kitchen knife use as far as I'm concerned. Which is, which is why I heat treat almost all of my using and kitchen knives at full thickness. That's right, I was going to, uh, I was leading up to that. Okay, so I told you in the heat treat portion why I heat treat these at full thickness and why I grind them at full thickness. I did not tell you about why it's best to heat treat these at full thickness when it comes to grinding them. All right, now you take a piece of this steel. Let's grab a piece of this, one of the scraps. Okay, here's a cutoff, right? This is 3 32nd inch 1095, right? It's the same stuff. In fact, you can probably see, yep, it was off of one of these blades here, okay? Now, you go to take this and you put it up to the grinder. Now, granted, if this was, you know, this long, you'd have an awful lot more leverage. The amount of force that's needed to put the blade into the belt to get the blade or the belt to cut the steel is enough that you will bend the steel. Notice it didn't say warp because it hadn't been hardened yet if you were doing, you know, a preheat treat grind. This stuff is really soft. Look at that. I mean, I'm not really even bending all that hard, okay? I mean, you can bend this stuff back on itself, you know, until you heat treat this stuff, it is extremely soft. So if you were trying to take a blade like this, that's that soft and hold it up to a belt and push into it to get the belt to cut it, 
if you're if you hold it like this guess what you're gonna bend it like that and it's gonna stay bent and then you're gonna straighten it and then you're gonna try to grab it on the other side and you're gonna bend it and you're gonna try to straighten it and you are gonna fight yourself tooth and nail to try to get an accurate preheat treat grind on that knife okay now if you're working with big choppers swords um, large heavy duty rough use type knives by all means you know do a pre-grind on those I mean if you're working with um, you know eighth inch stock or thicker you know then there's usually enough meat there that the blade isn't gonna bend quite so easy okay but still watch that you don't get it too thin prior to heat treat so that it wants to bend and warp more okay um, so heat treating them before grinding stiffens the blade up so that you can grind it accurately okay now and then what we were we were going for on the sticks okay that herder video he was grinding with uh, wait a minute let me back up just a second okay so the pre grinds on blades right if you are using the old school straight up aluminum oxide belts or you're using a hard wheel grinder or something like that something that's not very efficient you know there you have to weigh the benefits of easier grinding on the softer steel and the amount of trouble that grinding straight up soft steel is you know and it flex or bending while you're grinding it is going to happen or is going to you have to weigh those differences right with today's belts and with today's belts I'm talking about I use the the Norton blaze belts which apparently those are not even all that new anymore I guess they've got you know newer and better belts out now than those but those things will cut this hardened steel I mean you'll you'll end up with what looks like steel shavings on the floor with those belts I mean they they just cut they just flat out cut and it doesn't matter it seem to matter if it's hard steel soft steel what they just cut it right okay so <clears throat> this herder fellow <clears throat> he was using um, some really cool looking equipment um, and it seemed like he was using all hard wheel grinders I mean like like an old grinding wheel with an actual rock you know that, that spun that's what I mean by a hard wheel grinder in fact I don't even have one of those in the shop anymore um, <clears throat> And he was using um, what looked like wooden wheels that had leather facing that was like scored. And then he was coating that with like abrasive powder um, or abrasive paste, letting it dry and then, you know, using that to grind his knives. But in almost every single step of his grinding, he had a stick, a wooden stick that was shaped to hold that particular knife for that particular grinding operation. I saw that and they was grinding most everything wet and I saw that and I thought that stick would really I mean because I, I was fighting this I mean I was just getting into kitchen knives at the, the, the time and I was really fighting getting accurate grinds that weren't as thin as what I wanted them to be without overheating the, the blade and, you know, ruining the temper on it. So what we're going to do, and this will make a whole bunch of sense to you as we do it, okay? So what I've, I've done, since this is a new pattern, I've already made a new stick, and it's in the grinding room in the, the water bath uh, soaking up water, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and make a new stick for this particular pattern, which is... Um, my sab pattern pair it's based off a saboteur pairing knife that uh, that a fella sent me and said he wanted one like it I made him one similar to it and then there was always a couple of things that I didn't like about that pattern so I changed the pattern up and I think this is uh, a little bit closer to what I was after the handle on this one feels a little on the short side so I may end up when I come in and actually put the handle on it I might come in and take a little bit of this out I mean we're talking like now I I wear an extra large glove and most of them are really kind of tight to begin with until I you know break them in and everything so usually if I make a knife to where it feels a little bit small in my hand or feels perfect in my hand then most of my 
customers either say that the handle feels perfect or it feels slightly too big and you know that seems to be a pretty good place to be all right so um, we're going to go ahead and make a grinding stick for this pattern every one of my patterns has got their own grinding stick um, or they've got a I've got a grinding stick that uh, that works well enough with them okay so this is just a paint stick from Home Depot right the bigger one that you use to stir the five gallon buckets of paint okay this needs to the grinding sticks need to be made out of wood all right and the reason for that is because wood absorbs water and it holds water once you have this wood soaked and it is sopping wet it will act like the best heat sink you have ever seen okay then once it starts drying out from the heat of grinding you just dunk it back in your water tank and it gets wet again and it goes back to being a good heat sink okay these nails right here I'm not sure what size they are here but it's just a small nail um, it is roughly a half inch long it's got a small head on it I guess it doesn't really matter um, as long as it's a you know a fairly small nail like this right now my big old fingers I can't really hold it all that well so we use needle nose pliers and a hammer and we're gonna need one nail up in here now you get it started and then leave the blade there and that way you only drive the nail and you see it there you only drive the nail in halfway or a little bit over halfway but you want that nail to stop that blade from moving okay so you got one up in the front okay let's grab another nail here ah. What would we do without needle nose pliers? And these new, I lost my old set of tweezers um, in the move, and I bought this set right here from Walmart. It was in the ladies' makeup section. Um, it was the only set of tweezers I could find, and they're too small, but I got those from Jantz the other day. Um, I was working on pocket knives and just driving myself crazy because I couldn't pick everything up. I got this order from Jantz in just the other day, so uh, so now hopefully this next week I can get back to making pocket knives and actually be able to pick up all the screws because it was driving me. You know, I'd try to pick up try to pick up the screws because they're all tiny. Okay, so we get these nails. Okay, we get these nails put in, and then they're at the right depth so that they hold the blade. Right now, you flip it to the other side. And the points will hold the blade okay so now what we're going to do is we're going to outline the outline the blade here just the cutting edge and and part of the handle really and we're going to need to keep i mean we can take some of this off just so it kind of feels a little bit more like a blade instead of just a a chunk of wood okay so now we need to take this into the grinding room and then just grind the blade and kind of kind of shape it right so let's go on in here oh i need to grab safety glasses gotta grab the safety glasses kind of enjoy seeing and let's see how much time do we have here we're at 23 minutes okay go in here to the grinding room up in here as close as we can close the door now this is just um, you know this is just pine so we're not going to worry too much about uh, um, you know throwing on a mask and everything okay let's get you in a good spot here okay so what we need to do is cut this in half cut this down and then go ahead and grind this profile right here. Actually, let me go grab that knife. Oh, 
Okay. All right, so turn your volume down or watch your ears or whatever, because this is going to be loud. Now first we're going to cut this off and I'll show you a quick way to cut it off with the belt. Okay, we're at 26 minutes, so <clears throat> we'll go ahead and talk a little bit more about the advantage of these advantages of these sticks. We'll go ahead and shut you down, go ahead and upload the video, and then the next video will be actually grinding um, our new pattern with the uh, the soaked, you know, new stick. That's for the other pattern. Okay, so um, so a little bit of talk here about grinding wet. Well, well, first of all. All right, now see the see how that stick, you know, supports that blade, right? Okay, now, even with a thin bladed paring knife, when you step up to this grinder and you go to put force on here, now see how this blade right here, see how, I mean, you can see the flex here. Get you right up in here, okay. Now, even with a, a paring knife, see how that blade's flexing? It's flexing right over that belt, right? Okay. Now, so so when you do when it flexes like that. Now, granted, you don't, you're not supposed to really lay into these knives, right? Not on the grinding belt because you'll overheat them and everything. But still, I mean, if it's flexing with that amount of force at full thickness, once we start getting closer to our finished grind, it's going to be easier to flex because it's going to be thinner. It's going to be more flexible, right? Okay. So now imagine. It's flexing that easily, right? So now imagine trying to keep the belt cutting this nice and even across the entire two inch wide surface of this uh, platen while the blade is flexing. So if you push a little bit too hard, it's going to bow up. It's going to cut harder on the sides of the belt than it is in the middle because it's going to be bowing around it, right? Okay. Now you can mitigate that by the amount of pressure and where you put your, your thumb pressure on the blade, right? Okay. So when you're grinding, think about this as being a teeter-totter this way and this way. Okay. So you can control this uh, angle by the amount of pressure between this thumb and this thumb. Okay. This pressure you adjust that by the placement of your thumb on the tang. This hand is just a support until you go to grind the other way, you know, grind this way and then it's opposite, but I can't get my thumb and my hand in there. Okay, so if you put your thumb on this position of the tang, you'll tend to grind more towards the edge. You put your thumb in the middle of the tang, you tend to grind wherever your pre-grind is already gone, you put your thumb on the spine portion of the blade and you'll tend to grind more towards that side, right? Okay, so now you put this stick behind that blade and it's the same thing. Now you just put, you know, you use your, your pressure on the stick instead of on the blade, right? But now, look, there's not hardly near as much flex. I mean, I'm really kind of pushing in that. And it's given me some flex, but not near like what it was, okay? So these sticks really help to even out, you know, they provide a backing behind your blade so that you can really grind them thin and accurately because your, your blade isn't flexing 
around your platen. Okay? Now, so that's the best thing about them because you can control the amount of pressure and even out the, the pressure on your blade even as your blade gets thinner and thinner. Okay? Now, you take these things and you soak them because they are wood, they do uh, absorb moisture, and now that moisture is being held right up against the opposite side of that blade. So it's acting as a huge heat sink to pull. So this side, the belt is putting heat, the belt and the friction is putting heat into this side of the blade, and all this water that this wood holds is pulling it right back out, okay? It's kind of like, um, I mean, it holds water just like uh, like shaving soap does. You know, I mean, the biggest reason that you use shaving soap to provide a little bit of, of, of you know, um, slickness to reduce some friction, but it's to hold water in uh, in your whiskers so that, you know, they stay soft so that you can cut them more easily. Okay, well, the greatest thing about this, the stick, is besides besides providing support, it holds moisture up against that side of the blade and thereby acts as a heat sink. Okay, now, once you start getting your grinding going, okay, there's going to be a little bit of a gap in here because this, this edge is not going to stay this thickness for very long. It's going to get cut down almost immediately. Okay, now, once it starts getting cut down immediately, now granted, your heat sink is going to be a little bit farther away from your blade. There's going to be a gap there. But still, as you press that blade in, it will press it a little bit closer to that wood, and that wet wood will absorb, will pull that heat right out, okay? Now, the first time you use these, you're going to want to knock them points off of the nails, and then sometimes they'll slip in and out, so you can, you know, just kind of adjust your, your height of your nails from one side to the other, you know, just by pushing them on, on a piece of steel. But these things are, well, this one right here, we still need to drill a hole, so that, um, you know, we can put it on the nails. Put it on the nails with the, uh, the collection down there. Um, one more thing about the grinding sticks and grinding, because our next video is going to be an off, I mean, it's actually going to be grinding, and so it's going to be loud, right? <clears throat> grinding with water, so wet grinding versus dry grinding. Okay, if I lived in a place that was an awful lot warmer than what, it, than what it is here, I would wet grind everything every day all the time, right? Um, wet grinding is that cool, okay? Now, my wet grinding setup, setup is a, uh, uh, a tile saw water pump, and it's in the bottom of a five-gallon bucket of water at the bottom here. And then what we have is just quarter-inch sprinkler system tubing. Oh, and that one's... See, I haven't even hooked it. Oh, that one got broke. That one, the nipple got broke off while I was moving it. Um, so anyway, so you got a, a, a shutoff valve here. You know, the tubing comes up and it just drips into those tubes down there, drips onto the belt and it falls down, right? There are some guys that use sprayers. These sticks, if your water is dripping down the belt, it will actually go in between that gap, in between your blade and the, the wood as it develops as you grind the blade. Okay, now sometimes these sticks will warp, okay? And when they do, not if, but when, really. And that one's still nice and straight. But when they do, you just straighten it like you would... Um, you know, a, a knife blade. I mean, not with a hammer, but just straighten it in your hands. I mean, if the if the wood is soaked well enough, it will, you know, bend, and then you can re-bend it, and then it'll mostly stay there. All right? Um, you know, and I think that's about it with the sticks, um, except for to show you them in action. All right? So we're going to go ahead. I'm going to go back over, drill a hole into this one. It's going to go into the water thing. I'm going to go download this video, and then the next time we see each other, um, we're actually going to grind a knife. We're going to go ahead and grind. Uh, um, we'll do a rough grind, probably get the whole blade ground, and then um, probably at least get a base finish on it. I don't know if we'll actually uh, get to hand sanding um, and putting a nice finish on it or not. But anyway, so I guess I better look at you for this part. I'm supposed to be looking at the camera more. 
Okay, so that is um, the base. The, the biggest part of this video is these grinding sticks and how much um, easier they make accurate grinding of thin blades like kitchen knives, EDCs. Um, yeah, that's about all I use them for. Which, well, pocket knives, you can use them on pocket knives too. When you start doing swords and stuff, it, you know, it's, um, I mean, I guess you could, but, you know, that, that's usually a much thicker blade and it, it supports itself uh, well enough. So anyway, um, this is Joe Calton with Calton Cutlery. You can find me on the web, CaltonCutlery.com. Hope you enjoyed the video, and the next time we see each other, we will be grinding these knives. So we will see you next time.